before this day gathered in your name calling out to you your glory like a fire awakening desire we burn our hearts with truth you're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing open up the heavens we want to see you open up the floodgates almighty river flowing from your heart filling every part of our Presence in this place, your glory on our face. We're looking to the sky, descending like a cloud. You're standing with us now, Lord. Fill our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're seen. We want to see you open up the floodgates of my
here for this day gathered in your name calling out to you your glory like a fire awakening desire we burn our hearts with truth you're the reason we're here you're the reason we're singing open up the heavens we want to see you open up the floodgates almighty river flowing from your heart filling every part of our prayer your presence in this place your glory on our face we're looking to the sky Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord, fill our eyes. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, oh my. Hello, my name is Harold Milliken. I am the online worship host here at First United Methodist Church. Thank you so much for tuning in to our online worship opportunity. Our online worshiping community is a vital part of the life of our church, and I want to encourage you to get involved by becoming an online worship host. These hosts provide an interactive experience for our guests and members across all three of our online platforms. If you'd like to learn more about getting connected to our online community by becoming a worship host, you can email us at welcome at firstmethodist.org. Thank you. My name is Susie Rivera, and I'm the Director of Inviting and Welcoming. I'm so glad you're joining us for worship today. No matter if you're here in Baton Rouge or across the ocean in Cambodia, we want to let you know that you are a vital part of our community. Did you know that many of our weekly and monthly offerings are offered both in person and via Zoom? So you can join us from wherever you are at. Today I want to highlight one offering in particular, Believe and Belong. This event is designed for those who are interested in becoming a member of First United Methodist Church. We will spend some time learning about our church, the broader United Methodist Church, what it means to believe in Jesus, and end with an opportunity to join the church. If you'd like to attend this offering via Zoom or in person, you can email me, Susie Rivera, at welcome at firstmethodist.org.
Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Brady Witten, and it's a privilege to welcome you to worship here at First United Methodist Church in Baton Rouge. I welcome those of you who are joining us here in the sanctuary and those who are joining us from home. So as we worship today, we're going to continue reading through the book of Acts, uh, and we're going to hear a bit of biblical wisdom today that can help us to navigate the many complexities of life. Will you join me in prayer? Lord God, we thank you for uh, this time where you have called us to set aside the busyness of this world and to turn our attention to you in worship and praise. And Lord, Lord we ask that you would help us uh, to just center ourselves in this time and place to give you our whole selves, body, mind, and spirit. Lord, pour your spirit upon us, and it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And I invite you to stand as we join in our opening hymn together.
I invite you to remain standing as we together affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed that is before you. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. may be seated. The beautiful flowers that we all get to enjoy before us are given to the glory of God and in memory of Gordon Jones by Keith and Sandra Jones. The votive candle is in memory of Annie Chambers. And the rose here before us all honors the birth of Joseph Bro, the child of Charles and Jessica Creed, and the grandchild of Curtis and Lisa Creed. And for all of these reminders that just continue to bear witness that we do share this life together, we give God all the thanks and glory. And now let us turn our hearts toward God um, with humility and with great expectation as we go to him in prayer. Would you bow with me? Life-giving Lord, today is the day that you have made and we will rejoice. We are rejoicing and are glad in it. Help us here and now to rejoice as we experience your living, breathing word through proclamation. As we sing lustfully and with great zeal for the purpose of praising you. And now in this moment as we lift our hearts to you in prayer. O oh God who hears the prayers of the smallest child and the most wayward adult. Receive now the yearnings of our hearts. We thank you, Lord, for the love that we share with our, our loved ones, our family, and for those friendships beyond the family that are so dear to us. We thank you for purposeful work and restful leisure, for our bodies that help us explore mountains and forests, that allow us to search for seashells along white sand beaches and for our minds that help us to discern and decide with your help what is good and right and loving. Call us to rest in the midst of our fevered pace, that we experience your peace, your love, your call to be healers and restorers of this big, beautiful world. Lord, we pray for your relentless grace to feel and know and believe to our bones that you love us without strings attached. Use each of us, Lord, and our very gifts to bring light into dark places, to be spent in service to your Son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ both individually and together in community, Lord, give us eyes to see where we can be of help in living out your mission. And as we come before you in this moment, on this particular morning, we ask that you deposit into us humility and vulnerability to lift our hand when we need the gifts 
of our minds and our faith of others to accomplish what you've given us to do. Lord, it's oftentimes hard to ask for help. We are a get-or-done kind of people. So to raise our hand feels like weakness sometimes, feels like laziness. We don't want others to think less of us, so we go it alone, disguising our need. Help us all to summon the courage to ask for help when we sense it isn't necessary. In doing so, we know that you will surprise us. You will surprise us that we will see ourselves and others leading and loving and serving like Jesus. It is in his name and with his words on our lips that we now lift to you in unity that prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And so now as we prepare uh, to stand and to sing our next hymn, I want to remind all the children here in the room that when we are on that last verse of the hymn to come on down for this morning's children's message. And for those who are worshiping with us afar, gather around because this message is for you as well. Let us now stand to sing.
are y'all? Everybody's good. I like your sparkly shoes. Those are cute. I know. I know, I saw you earlier today in Sunday school. Okay, so I'm gonna mix it up for you today. I need everybody to see, you see that camera with the red light? Let's wave and say good morning to some of our friends who might be watching us from home because this children's sermon is for them too. So is everybody excited about Vacation Bible School? It's getting exciting. Okay, so today, this morning, our story comes from the book of Acts. And it tells how Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem, is getting bigger and bigger every day. People heard about Jesus and then told other people, and soon hundreds and even thousands of people decided to follow Jesus. So the apostles were very busy. They were preaching, they were teaching, and they were praying every day. But they were also busy helping people. Christians brought money to the apostles who in turn would buy food and give it to the hungry. And this was very important because some people didn't have a family to to care for them. And one group of people who didn't have a family were the widows. A widow was a woman whose husband has died. So the apostles gave food to the widows to help them. But there was a problem. The apostles were so busy that sometimes they couldn't get to everyone. Some widows were missing out, and they were hungry. And this made the people very unhappy. So the apostles gathered everyone together, and they said, we don't, any, we don't want anyone to miss out on the food, but it takes a lot of time to buy the food and then to pass it out to everyone. If we spend all of our time passing out the food, then we won't have enough time to pray and to teach about Jesus. So the apostles had an idea. They got everyone together and they said, we're gonna stop distributing the food so we can spend our time praying, preaching, and teaching, but we want you to choose seven other men to be in charge of passing out the food. You had, they had to make sure that the men were faithful to God and full of the Spirit, and they had to be wise because it would be their job to make sure everything was fair. So everyone thought this was a really good idea. So they chose seven men. The apostles prayed for these men, and they began their work. And from then on, the widows and everyone else received their fare of food, and the apostles taught even more people about Jesus. And now that everyone was helping in the work, the church was growing bigger and bigger. So I really like the way the apostles work together to solve a problem. And it reminds me a lot of about, well, it reminds me of a story that happened to me. So a long time ago, before you were even born, um, in the year 2002, which is a really long time ago, um, some people, some people in the church asked me to, if I would organize vacation Bible school. And I was like, sure, I can do that. And one of my jobs was to choose the craft. And so I was like, well, the theme this year is God's masterpiece. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a picture of all the kids and we're going to have these frames done and they're going to get to sand them and they're going to do the wood burning tool. And it's going to be really cool. So, but I didn't want to use just new wood. I wanted to drive around Baton Rouge and collect wood from fences that people were, like, getting rid of. And then my husband pointed out, he goes, well, we don't have that kind of saw at our house that you're going to need. And so I was like, okay, this is turning into a bigger job. And he said, how many do you need to make? And I was like, 300. And he was like, what? And then he was like, well, we don't have the kind of nails you need. And I all of a sudden felt very overwhelmed, and I was like, I cannot, I can't do this by myself. So we had, we invited our Sunday school class at the time to come over to our house, and people brought saws and the nail guns that we needed, and we fed them. And so we got all the frames done, so it was a good thing. Yes, sir. I, what, I was getting rid of a fence. You were getting rid of a fence one time? It was, too, it was falling apart. It was falling apart? you know what, you can take that wood and recycle it and make bird houses and picture frames and all sorts. You just have to make sure there's no bugs in it. Okay, but the guys already. Yeah, the guys already took it away. Yeah, sometimes it's better just to take it away too because it can have nails in it. 
But back to our story. So, how many of you came to church this morning and caught, saw some like different decorations? Maybe you saw some trees. Well, just wait until tomorrow because this afternoon a group of people are coming together and they are going to transform this church into a campsite. The theme this week is Camp Firelight. So um, we are busy, busy, busy helping to decorate. So I just want you to remember that teamwork makes the dream work. So even though you sometimes you feel like you can do it on your own, you need to ask for help. All right, so before you get to your seats, let's put a say a prayer together. Dear God, thank you for this day and an exciting week ahead. Remind us to ask for help when something just gets too big for us to handle it alone. Amen. Y'all have a great day. Way back in 2002 reminded me of something I saw this week that said, uh, be patient with me, I was born in the 1900s. (laughs) Right? Uh, As the children return to their seats, I want to invite you all to stand and to share the peace of Christ with one another. Uh, Those of you at home, I invite you to uh, share that peace in the comments uh, on whichever platform you're worshiping on. So one of the themes you'll uh, hear throughout worship this morning is that we are not alone, uh, that we have one another to lean on and we are part of a community of faith. And in this time where we turn to one another and remember that, I want to lift a few things that are happening in the life of the church to you. As I do, want to invite you to a few things. Uh, you'll find an attendance pad at the end of each one of your pews and inside that folder you'll find a slip of paper that says connect with us. Uh, if you would take just a moment and fill that out and let us know you're here in worship, I would appreciate it. Uh, If you're visiting, uh, I want to offer you a special welcome. We're really glad you're here. Uh, Take note of something in your bulletin that's called Discover First. It's a way that you can meet a few folks and learn things that are going on in the life of the church if you have questions and and want to do that. Uh, If you're visiting, I would also ask you on that Connect With Us uh, pad of paper to share Uh, email address or some contact information with us. I I really do promise we're not going to start bugging you, but we just want to reach out and say welcome and, uh, of course, see if there are questions we might be able to answer. You'll also find in your pews a prayer request card. If you have prayer requests, uh, we invite you to fill one of those out, and those can go in the offering plate as they come by, or you can share them with me at the end of the service. And then finally, we will be taking up an offering, and you will find a QR code in your bulletin for some electronic giving options that we invite you to take advantage of. And for those of you online, you'll find uh, the connect, connect link, a prayer link, and that online giving option uh, there as well. So uh, as Sherry mentioned, this week uh, we will have Vacation Bible School here, here at the church. It's going to start tomorrow. The theme is Camp Firelight, and so if you already saw some of the decorations, the church will continue to be transformed through the rest of the day. Uh, we are expecting several hundred children, uh, and that effort is going to be led by about 50 adult and 50 youth volunteers. Uh, Uh, There's two people in particular that I want to ask you to pray for, and that is Emily Fontanet and Emily McElwain, who are the Vacation Bible School directors this year, Uh, and it is a big job. So pray for the two of them, uh, pray for all of their helpers, and pray for the children as we share the love of Christ with them this week. I also want to make sure you see in your bulletin that there is uh, going to be a men's social this Wednesday night at Superior Grill on Government. Okay, so I want to make sure everybody gets that. Which superior grill? Government. Got it. It's going to be from 5 to 7 p.m. Uh, Eric Lockridge is, uh, is organizing this, and so if you're a man in the church and want to meet some other dudes in the church, come on. Uh, I'm planning on being there. It's uh, just a, a casual time of uh, fellowship and, and just being together. With those things said, I'll invite our ushers to come forward as we take up our offering, and as they come, uh, I invite you to bow your heads with me in prayer. Gracious God, uh, you bless us in more ways than we can count. And we probably don't often enough stop and give you thanks. And so in this moment uh, where we present these offerings and gifts to you, 
we do say thank you, Lord. Thank you for all of the ways that you bless us. Uh, And Lord, from our gratitude, we return these gifts to you to be used for your work, the building up of your kingdom on this earth, and the sharing of the great news of your love in Christ Jesus. Bless this offering. Bless all that it allows us to do. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. before you. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, 
we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Hear this reading from the book of Acts. Now during those days, when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles, who prayed and laid their hands on them. The word of God continued to spread, the number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we are reading through the book of Acts uh, during the summer months. Months. I hope that some of, you, some of you are reading along, and we find ourselves in the sixth chapter today. Um, and one of the reasons that I've wanted us to revisit these early stories of the church is that there is an enthusiasm that we see there for Jesus and for His way and for the message uh, that I hope uh, that we might like recapture a little bit of that enthusiasm. Uh, we also see that the Holy Spirit is present and at work in power powerful ways uh, amidst, amidst the early Christians and in people's lives. And I don't know about you, but I'd like to have a little more of that power and presence of the Holy Spirit uh, in my life. So may, maybe these stories can help us to, to reconnect with some of that. Today's reading is a bit more practical uh, in that there are a few pieces of biblical wisdom that I see here uh, and that I have applied in my life that I have found very helpful, especially when uh, life gets to be a little overwhelming or a little too complicated or in those times when I am looking for clarity or direction. Uh, so I want to kind of explore this and again see if we can piece out some of those uh, biblical bits of wisdom and that they might be a little help help to you as well. Uh, so one of the most beautiful things that we see in the early church is that they really took care of each other. So uh, if, if somebody was hungry in the early church, what'd they do? They fed them. Uh, if somebody needed clothing in the early church, what'd they do? They clothed them, right? And in today's reading, we see a particular way that they did this in that there was apparently a daily distribution of food that went out to the widows in the community. And the widows would have been particularly vulnerable people because uh, by and large, this was not absolutely true, but by and large, women in those days were dependent upon their husbands for their livelihood. So when their husbands uh, died, they would have, again, been, been at risk and so the early community cared for the widows. Um, but again, they did, they did sort of a daily distribution of food to the widows. Think of it as the first Meals on Wheels program. Okay? So they went out in the community and they distributed food to those who had need. But we also see in this story that some of the widows were being neglected. Um, and what we need to understand is that there were really two primary cultural groups in the early church at that time. So uh, these were all Jewish people who had become followers of Jesus and the way, okay? But there were two primary cultural groups. One was a group that here uh, we, that are called the Hebrews. And these would have been people who had grown up in Jerusalem and they would have been Aramaic speaking. So that was one cultural group. The other group is called the Hellenists. These would have been people, Jewish people who grew up outside of Jerusalem, and their primary language would have been Greek, and they also grew up heavily influenced by Greek and Roman culture. So you got, got these two groups here? Uh, I, I thought about it this way. One group put tomatoes in their jambalaya, and the other group did not. Right? All right, you with me, Louisiana people? Like one people, but two, two, two groups. 
Uh, now, we're not told why one group of widows is being overlooked. That, that information isn't there. Was it the language barrier? Could, could have been a language barrier. Uh, was it that people tend to like to hang out with people that are like themselves? We, we do that, right? Or was it simply a logistical issue, like the church had grown and there were too many people and, and, and some people were just being left out? We don't know. Whatever the reason is, the Greek-speaking Christians began to complain about it. And this is really the first real problem that we see the early church facing. And this is also where we see the wisdom of the apostles emerge. So the apostles see the problem that they've got, and so they pull the people together, and they say, look, we've got a plan. Here's the plan. And they started by saying this, look, our job, our role is to minister to the Word of God, to preach and to teach and to share the gospel message with the world. That's our job, right? Um, And they said, but you know, we also realize this distribution of food is important, so select seven people from among you, and and we will appoint them this task of distributing the food. And uh, there are two things right here uh, in in the disciples' plan or in the apostles' plan that I think contain some really helpful biblical wisdom. Uh, And again, particularly helpful in navigating the complex world that we all find ourselves living in. Uh, And so, I just want to lift these two things to your attention. The first thing we see is this. The apostles were clear about who they were and what their job was. They were clear about who they were and what their job was. So I don't know if you caught this, but uh, when the disciples presented their plan to the community, uh, this, is, this is basically what they said. They said it would not be good for us to neglect uh, serving the Word to serve tables. Okay? Y'all, y'all caught that part? So when you heard that, how did that, how did that sit with you? How, how did, did, it, did it sound maybe a little arrogant? Seriously, like, you know, so we, ha- we have to give ourselves to the proclamation of the Word. We can't wait on tables, right? Did y'all hear it that way? A lot of people do. Um, I mean, and, and this doesn't sound very Jesus-y, does it? Right? I mean, Jesus called us to be servants to, to people. So are the apostles above serving people? Any of you hear it that way? Anybody? So if you, I see some nods. I always say, don't leave me hanging up here, right? Okay, so let me ask the question in a little different way, and let me see if you still see this as arrogant. So would it be arrogant for Paul Skeens to say something like this? It would not be good for me to neglect pitching in order to go out and learn to play outfield. What do y'all think? Y'all know who Paul Skeens is, right? 101 mile per hour fastball. Would it be arrogant of Paul Skeens to say, hey, look, uh, I I, I shouldn't neglect pitching so that I can go learn to play outfield. Is that arrogant? No, what is it? It's smart, right? It's also the truth, right? Or how about this one? This one's been a little more complicated with people through the morning. So Taylor Swift, would, would it be wise for Taylor Swift or would it be arrogant of her to say, hey, it wouldn't be good for me to neglect performing in order to go work in the ticket, ticket booth at my concert? Is that arrogant of her or is, or is it just smart? Is it, is it the truth, right? You with me? So I think this is what we're seeing from the early apostles. They understood that they were uniquely qualified to to do something, and they were uniquely qualified to teach people about Jesus. Why? Because they had actually walked with the guy. They They had lived with him. They had heard him teach. They I mean, they were intimately connected with Jesus, and other people didn't have that. And so they said, our primary task, our primary role here is to go out and to teach people about Jesus and to proclaim people about Jesus. Now, what would have happened if they had laid aside that teaching and preaching ministry to drive the Meals on Wheels bus? What would have happened? Would the, would the church have continued? Would it continue? You know, it might have, but, but again, they just, they had a level of connection with Jesus that nobody else had. They were clear about who they were, and they were clear about what their job was. So, by the way, who would it hurt if Paul Skeens uh, stopped pitching and started focusing on the outfield? Who would it hurt? The whole team, right? The whole organization. Who would it hurt if, uh, if Taylor Swift stopped performing? Now, this is where it got challenging because some people earlier said nothing. <laughs> but look, we don't want to get in trouble with the Swifties, okay? Who would it hurt? Who would it hurt? It would hurt the hundreds of people that she employs, probably the thousands. It would hurt all of her fans. It would hurt, right? So, and, and who would it hurt if the disciples had stopped doing what they were uniquely called to do and started doing this, this other task, right? So here's another question. 
What would have happened if the disciples had tried to do it all? So uh, years ago, I was at a leadership uh, sort of seminar thing, and I'll never forget this example somebody gave me, and I remember it so much that 20-something years later, I still have these juggling balls on my desk, okay? So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a good juggler, by the way. Patty's going to help me out here. So uh, I can juggle two balls. It's this amazing feat that I'm about to show you all, okay? So, so here I am juggling my two balls. Now, Hold on a second, Patty. Don't, don't throw that one in here yet. But let me ask you this. If Patty throws in a third ball, what do you think is going to happen? Okay, am I going to drop one ball? I'm going to drop all of them. Right, so, so go ahead, Patty. Let's try it. Ready? I, I didn't even catch that one. So, uh, thank you. This, this is a mistake that a lot of times I think people make. I make it I try not to, but we think, hey, if I take on just one more thing, if I take on just one more task, if I put one more thing on my plate, that what's going to suffer is the one extra thing that I've taken on, or what's going to suffer is the one thing I've added to my plate. What's really going to suffer? All of it, right? We can't do it all ourselves. We can't, right? Um, So uh, the disciples did not make this mistake. They knew who they were, they knew what their job was, and the, and the question I want to ask you today is this, do you know who you are, and do you know what your job is in the world? Now, uh, Paul Skeens and Taylor Swift are sort of extreme examples outside of the realm of most of our lives. Let me, let me bring it a little closer to home, right? Um, like many of you uh, in the work that I do, and as a parent and other things, I am pulled in a thousand different directions. Amen? Amen. Okay, and it's just the world that we live in. We are pulled in a thousand different directions. So one of the things that I have found very helpful, and it comes from the, the disciples in this scripture, is that I have found it very helpful to get clear about who I am and what my job is in the world. So there are basically four, four things that I've boiled this down to. The first thing is this. I am a child of God, and I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's first in my life. Uh, the second thing is I am a husband to my beautiful wife, Tasha, here. Uh, we celebrated our 26th and a half anniversary last week. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the half is a long story, I'll tell you sometime. Anyway, um, I am a father, and I am a pastor in that order, in that order. So uh, years ago, I had somebody uh, say this to me as a preacher friend of mine, and I found it very helpful. They said, Brady, your church is going to have multiple pastors, but your children are only going to have one dad, right? And, and it helps me to remember that, right? Uh, I also like to remind my children pretty regularly, and Tasha and I do tell them this, hey, look, one day you're moving out. You're, you're, you're moving out of the house. And so it's, it's me and her for, for the rest of our lives, right? It's until till death do us part, right? Uh, parents, your kids ever try to pull you apart, right? Uh, working against each other, it's important for your kids to know that. It's it's me and her, right? Uh, And I will say this, whenever I stop living as a disciple, whenever I stop centering myself as a child of God and as a disciple of Jesus, everything else goes south, right? And so there's a a level of priorities there. I'll never forget the time that uh, I was doing, uh, working with a couple before a wedding, and I usually meet with couples a couple of times, and they wanted to meet with me on a Saturday. That worked for their schedule. Well, Saturday is really a day that I try to kind of like hold off and say, "This, this is a family day. This is the one day that I get to spend with my family. I don't always do that as well as I should, but I, but I really try. But this time I told this couple, no, I can't meet with you on Saturday. We'll have to do it another time. And I could tell they weren't real happy with me about it. Well, uh, so at the wedding rehearsal, the father of the groom came up to me and, and kind of came up and, and said to me, and, and I, thought, I thought I was in trouble with him, he said, my son was not very happy that you wouldn't meet with him on Saturday. And I kind of thought, oh no, this, here it comes, right? I'm, I've really messed up. And he said, but you know what I told him? I told him, one day when you have children of your own, you'll remember that that preacher told you no, and you'll be glad that he showed you how to set those, those boundaries, right? So, so again, it's, for me, it's uh, child of God, disciple, husband, father, pastor, 
in that order. And do you see where when life gets complex and starts pulling at you that knowing that, knowing who, who am I and what's my job, that it helps you to kind of sort things out and helps you to make it through those times? You all with me? Now, I know some of you are thinking, Brady, I am way past that child-rearing work part of life, right? But listen to me. You still need to know who you are, and you still need to know what your job in life is. Uh, I'll never forget the time I was teaching a class called Momentum for Life, and it was a book written by a pastor named Mike Slaughter. And this was a class where uh, people were, were going to come in, and we were kind of going to think about our lives and think about our priorities, and kind of you were supposed to set a personal mission statement for your life. So this is, this is what I'm going to do. Most of the people in the class were in their 30s, maybe 40s. But there was one woman who signed up for the class who was 78 years old, Carol. And when I looked at the roster, I went, what is Carol doing coming to this Momentum for Life class, <laughs> right? So we sat down on that first day, and we went around the table, and everybody kind of said, this is why I'm, this is why I'm here. And I will never forget what Carol, at 78 years old, said. She said, my purpose in life is to show my children how to age well. How to age gracefully, right? Uh, maybe your purpose in life right now is not raising kids and going to work. Maybe it's caring for an elderly parent or caring for a partner. Like, but who are you and what is your job right now? The disciples had that kind of clarity, and that clarity was wisdom, was wisdom that you and I should have as well. So another thing we see from the disciples is this. Uh, they were willing to ask for help. Okay, So they knew who they were. They knew what their job was, but they were also willing to ask for help. So years ago, I heard Andy Stanley uh, speak. You all know who Andy Stanley is? It's Charles Stanley's son. Charles Stanley was that famous Baptist preacher who died not too long ago. But Andy Stanley was the youth director in his dad's church for a time. And uh, when he was a youth director, he had lots of events to plan. And he said he was terrible at planning events. But he said, look, but I was the youth director. It was my job. I had to get it done. This was mine to do. And, you know, and he said, so he just planned the events badly. And he said, and the events, the events did not go well, and there were always kind of details that were messed up. And, and, uh, and, and again, but he thought, but this is, this is my job. I, I, I have to do it. And by the way, he was also not happy about planning events. A little secret about human beings, we don't like to do things we're not good at, Right? right? So anyway, so he's, he's doing the events. The events are terrible. He's not happy, but he keeps doing them, keeps doing them, when finally one day comes along and he talks to the team of people that he works with and he finally gives up and admits, I need help. I need help. And this is when his team said, oh, thank God that you asked, right? Because we have been waiting for you to get to the point where you would just say, please help me. And one of the women actually said, Andy, you know what? I actually like to plan events. It's something I really enjoy doing. I'm pretty good at it. So he humbled himself enough to say, hey, will you help me? And this other person on the team started planning the events. And guess what? Things started going better. They had better events. And Andy was able to focus on his speaking and teaching, which is his real gift. And if you know anything about Andy Stanley, he's probably one of the most sought-after Christian speakers that there is now, right? So better events, better preaching and teaching, and happier people, right? All because of what? He asked for help. So I have good news for you. God did not create us to do life all by ourselves. And this is one of the things we see in the early church, that they really leaned on each other and they counted on each other. They recognized, hey, this is my strength and my giftedness. And in the areas where they were weak, they said, can you, can you help me, right? And because of that, uh, the, the, the ministries of the church continued to grow and people continued to become followers of Jesus. So God didn't create us to do life all by ourselves. I have good news for you, and some of you really need to hear this. You don't have to do it all by yourself, right? You don't have to do it all by yourself. So uh, can you think of a place in your life where you need help, where you need help? Um, maybe it's some place you're working outside of your area of giftedness, uh, maybe you've just taken on too much and you're exhausted, right? You go, I just can't, I can't do it anymore. Can, can you think of some place like that? Um, is there might be somebody around you who's waiting for you to say, hey, I could use some, I could use some help.
right? Uh, they actually might have the gifts that you need to, to move forward and, and to do something. Uh, and again, this can play itself out in all places in life, right? So obviously, the obvious application is in the life of the church, right? Any church leaders in here, people who are leading Sunday school classes, Bible studies, and other groups, right? Uh, do you know who you are and what your job is, and are you willing to ask for help, right? But this can also play itself out. This, this wisdom is applicable everywhere. It can play itself out in your work. How about at home? How about at home? Is there some place that you just need to say, oh, I need help. I need help. So, in the end, uh, the apostles' plan works. It works. They stayed focused on their calling because they knew who they were and they knew what they had to do. Uh, but at the same time, they invited others to help them. And again, we read that the church expanded and grew and kept going and kept going. And I just, I, want to, I really want you to imagine this for a moment. What would have happened if the apostles had stopped preaching and teaching? What would have happened if they had tried to do it all? So, this biblical wisdom uh, can help us in so many different places in life. Listen, there is only one you, and God has put you in a specific place, in a particular family, in a particular workplace, in a particular church to do what only you can do. You don't have to do it all by yourself. Ask for help. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So in this theme of not doing it all by ourselves, uh, one of the great gifts that God has given us is the gift of the church, the gift of community. And uh, it's always a privilege as part of worship to invite anyone here who's looking for a church home uh, to consider making First Methodist your church family. So we have a gathering called Believe and Belong. You can find a little more information about it in your bulletin. Uh, we uh, share a meal together, get to know each other, uh, talk about what does it mean to believe in Jesus and what does it mean to belong to a community of faith. And uh, th consider, consider this your invitation. If you're looking uh, to become a member of First Methodist, uh, we would love to have you. I invite you to stand now as we sing our closing hymn together. The words are in your bulletin. <laughs>
Go now and may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace. You had another surgery? Yeah.